we're recording. Screen is shared. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, today is April 7th. Uh, my name is Brian. Today we're going to be talking about plotting with ggplot2. Um, and I also have a very embarrassing secret to tell you um, that's actually relevant to this class. So um, I was supposed to tell you back on syllabus day that during week six, um, I will not be here in the classroom. I will just record the lecture and the lab for that week. Um, I'm getting I'm getting married that week, so don't tell my fiance that I did not mention that I was going to be getting married that week um, <laughs> during syllabus day. Um, so just mark your calendars for week six. We're going to be talking about, I believe, functions that week, um, which is okay because it gets almost entirely replaced by what we learned in week seven. So we're cool. Okay, but this week we're talking about ggplot2. We're gonna be making graphs and all that. Do we have any questions about things from last week? Maybe your homework, that kind of thing, before we get started. Hands? Um, I believe it'll send you a link that is just like a text box and it will show up as a comment on their end where they submitted their thing on Canvas. And it's not anonymous, so. Be nice. Any other questions? Yes. Sure. So the reason that we would want to run something in the console is if it's like quick or we don't want to keep it. So for instance, when we install a package, if we install a package within a markdown, it will crash your markdown. But you install it in your console because it only has to happen once. It's relatively quick and we're not going to run it again. Of course. Um, okay. Then let's get started. I This is a relatively long lecture, so I think we'll go the whole time, which is a shame because it's opening day for baseball and I wanted to be back in time to watch my Braves, but that's okay. <clears throat> So before we get started talking about graphs and plots and all that, um, let's talk about a few useful things that maybe you encountered during your first homework, um, but I didn't feel like fit in week one stuff. So the first thing is comments. You may have noticed that sometimes I've written code that looks like this. It'll say assign to new dot object uh, a vector of the numbers one through 10. And then it'll say, uh, pound sign or hashtag. I'm going to say hashtag throughout, even though I remember phone books. Uh, hashtag making vector of one to 10. Okay. And so the hashtag is known as the commenting symbol in R. Anything written on the same line after this symbol will not be run by R. This is really useful for annotating your code to remind yourself or others what you're doing in a section. So, like right now, I'm on this RA project and uh, I'm picking up where somebody left off because they got a real job and they didn't comment anything. So a lot of it has been a lot of tough work trying to read and understand all of their code and what they're going through at the time. Um, you'll note that in our markdown documents, this functions a little bit differently. So if you do this outside of a code chunk in an R markdown document, it's actually how you create headers. Um, you might have noticed during your homework. Okay, great. The next thing is saving files. You can save an R object on your computer as a file to open later. So any sort of object you've made into your environment, you can save your computer using the save function. And it'll have this sort of syntax. So it'll say, save the object that you wish to save, and then the path where you want to save it. And you will have to specify, um, the file extension. So it's going to be a .r data file if you want to save just one object uh, in this manner. Although we typically would not do this, there are some special cases where you might. 
um, something like, uh, let's say you work in GIS and you made like a really complicated geography for some coastline somewhere and you want to save just that so you can open it back up later without having to create the map yet. Something like that. Uh, hang on. Uh, yes, you can save a function this way. Um, although what I tend to do when I want to save functions is I have like a whole R script full of them. And then I'll use the source function that just runs the whole script. And so then I have like all eight or so functions or whatever that I use on the regular. Okay. You can open these saved files using the load function and you just say load and then the file path to wherever that object is being saved. And it will just, um, it'll populate right into your environment. So you don't have to save it to its own object. A reasonable follow-up question might be, but where are these files being saved and loaded from? Uh, your working directory is the answer to that. R saves files and looks for files to open in your current working directory. You can ask R what this is. So like when I knit these, uh, my current working directory was at my home computer in my documents um, in the file for the course website in the lectures in the week thing I couldn't figure out how to make it. Not go over the edge of the PowerPoint i'm sorry. Um, but perhaps you want to run this on your own machine and check it out um, so, for instance. Uh, we're in my downloads folder on the school drive for me right now. Similarly, you can set your working directory like this using the set working directory function uh, and you specify the file path where you'd like to have your working directory point to things. And that way, every time you run save, for instance, all of those objects that get saved will go to your working directory. Um, there's another workaround way that you can do this. You can go to session and then set working directory and then like click through where you'd like to set it. Um, we can talk, we'll talk later on in the course why this is like not best practice, but if it's just you and it's, you're not going to tell anybody, that's fine. Um, one thing that's important um, relative to this class and making documents is you don't want to set working directories within our markdown documents. This can often get confusing for your R markdown. The best practice here is to simply put your R markdown where your working directory is um, and it will automatically save there and it will automatically update r to count that as your working directory if that's the only file you have open um, a bit on managing files when managing r projects it is normally best to give each project such as a homework assignment uh, its own folder I tend to use this following system. Others use different systems, but this one works for me. So this is just like my opinion and it's not necessarily like a thing you can read about. Um, every class or project has its own folder. Each assignment or task has a folder inside of that, which is the working directory for that item. .rmd and .r files are named clearly and completely so that I never am like, okay, this one's called analysis and this one's called uh, write up like that. I don't like that. Uh, for example, this presentation is located and named in the my github.io, the class for lectures, it's week two, and it's called the name of the class week two ggplot2.markdown. Uh, you can use whatever system you want, but just try to be consistent. I did not always use the same system. And now if I wanted to check on documents from when I was a second year, it would be a hot mess. Um, you also don't want to lose work um, by losing or overriding files because of uh, not having a consistent procedure. So I would just say, maybe sit down and like spend like a half an hour really collecting all your files in a way that you feel like you'll remember forever. Uh, for large projects containing many files, I recommend using RStudio's built-in project management system uh, that's found in the top right of the RStudio window. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, I think, in week 10, um, since it's not super relevant to our class because we don't have like 
tons of different R scripts that we're handling for a homework assignment per se. Um, but I'm talking about this button over here. If you want to learn more about this, there's information about that on the course website. And you could also uh, just like Google our projects and there's a lot of really great information about how to manage lots of files that way. Um, so like big projects that I'm on, I tend to use our projects. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I, in really, really small text, I added at the bottom here, um, just like something that you might wanna check out. But again, I think is a little bit outside the scope of this class. Uh, for journal articles, like if you're putting a publication together, I recommend Ben Marwick, who I think is in anthropology here. Y'all know Ben? Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you'll see him around at Teacher Blast stuff, whatever. Um, our, our tools is really, really great for um, keeping track of files and that kind of thing. And Husky Down is really great for uh, making markdown documents that are already in the correct setup for UW dissertations and theses. Um, also, Chuck, who used to teach this class, has a demo presentation about how to make RR tools work. Um, check that out. Uh, we mainly work with three different types of files in this class. That is Markdown. These are Markdown syntax files where you write code that makes documents. Okay. There's also .r files. These are R syntax files where you write code to process and analyze data without making an output document. So I wanna make sure that that distinction is clear. Um, I know it's really tough the first week to really clarify why you would wanna use a .r instead of a .markdown, that kind of thing. Um, but the markdown makes documents and a .r file does not. And then we output to .html. Um, these are output documents created when you knit a markdown document. So you can also make a .pdf. Um, the reason I don't super fully describe how to make a .pdf in this class is that there are several differences between operating systems on how to make the PDFs run. Um, and it's a lot of a headache for me to troubleshoot that for all of you, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I did mention before, while it's beyond the scope of this class, you can use source um, function to run an R script inside of a markdown or an R file. And this will just run your whole document. So if you have a bunch of functions that you've written, or let's say you have an R script that just cleans data or something, you could just say, once you have updated data, source the one that cleans it, and then it will output the new clean data set, and you can use that in your markdown instead of having the markdown itself do all of the cleaning things. This will often save time um, and lets you uh, really piece out all of the different sections of your projects. <clears throat> so be sure to make sure you understand the differences between these file types. I am always happy to answer this question on clarification. So. Don't hesitate to ask. Okay, now we're gonna dive into like the meat and potatoes of class today. Um, the first thing of course is talking about data. So we're going to be using the Gapminder data, um, both for examples in class today and for your homework. We'll be working with uh, Hans Rosling's Gapminder project. An excerpt of these data can be accessed through an R package called Gapminder. Uh, they were cleaned and assembled by Jenny Bryan at UBC. Uh, much of this class is based on work by Jenny Bryan, so big shout out to Jenny Bryan. So in the console, run install.packages gapminder. I will join you. Okay, and then run library gapminder so that you have it with you. Okay. 
So the data frame we will work with is called Gapminder. It's available once you've loaded the package. So let's see the structure of it. We run structure Gapminder. We'll see um, that we have a tibble. It has 1,704 rows and six columns. These six columns are country, continent, year, life expectancy, population, and GDP per capita. Other things to note here, that country and continent are factor variables. Factor variables are, I'm sure we're all familiar with, um, but maybe not under the term factor. You might think of like a Likert scale is a factor variable where something that is, uh, is an ordered list of, um, or perhaps an unordered list of content. So here our factor levels for continent are like Africa, the Americas, Oceania, Asia, and Europe, I believe, are the five in this data set. Um, and you might liken this to a Likert scale, which is like good, bad, fair, how are you feeling today? But when you load it into the data set, it'd be one, two, and three, how are you feeling today? Okay. Okay, I jumped ahead of myself in the <laughs> uh, slides a little bit. I don't have a really great working memory of this set of <laughs> slides because there's 74 of them. So don't mind me if I jump around a little bit today. Um, but we'll spend a lot more time working with factors later using the forecast package, which is like the tidyverse way of cleaning up factors and dealing with them. A few things to note here. Uh, there are many observations. There are 1,704 rows. Um, this is many in terms of like compared to the set we used for homework one, um, but soon we'll be working with data sets that are like, you know, 500,000. It has a nested hierarchical structure, which is that information is within year, within a country, within a continent, and that these are panel data. They're, I'm trying to think of the word that Chris Adolf uses. Cross-sectional time series. Okay, let's talk about subsetting this data. We we'll want to be able to slice up this data frame into subsets. So like just the rows for Afghanistan, for instance, or just the rows for 1997. We'll use a, a package called dplyr to do this neatly. dplyr is part of the tidyverse family of R packages that are the focus of this course. So you might want to take the time to install that packages tidyverse. However, uh, if you haven't before, this is kind of like a minute or two, sometimes longer amount of installation because of how many packages are within the umbrella of tidyverse. Um, yeah, this will install a large number of our packages that we'll use throughout the term, including dplyr. Uh, dplyr is very useful and powerful package that we'll talk more about soon, but today we're going to use it just for filtering the data. So when we load dplyr, note it'll give you this sort of message. It'll say attaching package dplyr. The following objects are mask, um, filter, lag, intersect, set diff, set equal, and union. And often I get the question like, is this an error? Um, short answer is no. When you load packages in R that have functions sharing the same name as functions you already have, the more recently loaded functions will overwrite the previous ones. So it masks them. Okay. So this message is just, just to let you know that um, and tell you what specific functions are being over, not, or not overridden, are being uh, masked. To avoid showing this in your R markdown file, you can say add um, message equals false or include equals false to your chunk that loads in your packages. Uh, sometimes you may get a warning message when loading packages, uh, usually because you aren't running the latest version of R. This is the most typical version. Um, and you can just set a message equals false or include equals false to hide this. Or you can update R to the most recent version to deal with this completely. I don't tend to update R that often um, myself. And so I get this message kind of a lot. Um, I probably update it like, I don't know, once every six months, maybe less. 
I feel like there's something I want to show. Okay, never mind. No, I should show. The okay. So when you load dplyr, it says here it gave us this message. But let's say that I still wanted to use the other version of filter that was masked. The way you would do that is so we see that it's from the stats package. We would just say stats and then colon colon filter. And that's how we would get access to that. Um, what this syntax is saying is look inside of this package and then provide me the function. And it's pretty easy when you're in our markdown to deal with that. If you just say like stats uh, colon colon, it'll often give you this like scroll wheel. So even if you don't kind of remember what you're looking for, uh, <laughs> you'll be able to find it that way. We'll talk a little bit more about that functionality later, but trying to preempt questions a little bit. Okay, let's talk about pipes. Dplyr allows us to use magreader operators, which is this percent greater than percent we're calling this a pipe uh, to pipe data between functions. So instead of nesting functions, which I'm sure you all got a taste of during your first homework, where you'd say like, I want the log of the mean of the population column in the Gapminder data set, you would say this, which reads as take the population column from the Gapminder data and then get the mean and then send the output of that to the log. So pipes read left to right all the way through, which tends to make it a lot easier as uh, calculations get more complicated. So again, this is, we'll take this data and then get the mean of that data and then get the log of that value and we'll get the same one. So these are equivalent expressions, um, but in the, dplyr syntax, we read it left to right instead of this inside out mess. This is useful for us, especially as we approach our homework two, um, if we want to filter data frames. So here what happens is I say I have the Gapminder data and then filter country equals equals Algeria. So what is this doing? Do we have a good guess? Our table has gone from 1,704 rows to just 12 here. Yeah, it just gives us back the observations for Algeria by looking in the country column. So let's talk about how this works. We're using what's called a logical expression here. So what's working under the hood in order to get uh, country equals equals Algeria to give us back only the rows that are uh, about Algeria is it something like this, okay? So in this example, what I've done is I've taken the first 50 uh, elements of the country column in Gapminder. And I said, uh, equals equals to Algeria. And you'll see that it provides us back trues and falses related to this expression here. Okay, so like here is like, I don't know, Albania and, or Afghanistan and like Albania. And then for all of the rows that are Algeria in the country column, it provides us with true instead of false. And so what filter does is it says, among these falses and trues, only give me back the trues. So logical expressions can only return back trues and falses. Um, you might've seen when we use the subset operator that elements for which true is given um, are returned while those corresponding to false are dropped in this same kind of situation. Okay, so I'm going to describe it here a few uh, common logical operators that we'll be using throughout the course. Um, you can see that we can use equals equals for testing if things are equivalent. So 
we said among all of the values that are in the country column, which ones are the same as the word Algeria? Those ones are true, and I only want to keep those. That's what we said with the filter. There are other logical operators. An important one is not equal to, which is exclamation point equal to. A lot of times I use the not equal to rather than anything else, because it's normally easier to come up with exceptions than it is to come up with like the universe of all the things that you want to keep. There's also greater than, greater than or equal, greater than and equal, less than, less than and equal to. An important one also is the percent in percent. Uh, I don't know another name for this logical operator, unfortunately, but it's used for checking when things are equal to one of several values. So say we want to know things that are countries that are Algeria and Canada. So we could just give country equals equals, instead of country equals equals, we would say country percent and percent Algeria and Canada. And we would get back both of those for true. I'll show you examples of these so you don't have to like vigorously write notes. Um, we can also combine multiple conditions. The ampersand means that both conditions need to hold in order for something to be true. The bar means at least one condition needs to hold. So we often call this just or. And the exclamation point inverts logical conditions. So a true will become a false and a false will become a true. Um, sometimes when you're like getting rid of NAs in your data set, it's easier to just say, give me things that are not NA, right? And we'll use the exclamation point to do that. I'll show you how to do that, I think, next week. Uh, we'll use these a lot, so don't worry too much right now if this is just like, well, a lot of information. Um, sure. So it looks at a like set of conditions and says, do any of these match those conditions? Um, an example of a multiple conditions. So we can take the Gapminder data and then filter to things in the country column that are equal to Oman and year is above 1980. And so both of these conditions need to hold in order for something to be true. So you'll see that the country is Oman and this year is greater than 1980. And that's true for all the rest of the things in the rest of this data set. So the ampersand is like a Venn diagram and only wants to give you the middle portion. Whereas the bar, the or, um, we could say, take the Gapminder data and then filter country equals Oman or the years greater than 1980. We'll give you the things that fit in any of these two bubbles. Be cool? Okay. Let's talk about saving a subset of our data. So if we think a particular subset will be used repeatedly, we can save it and give it a name like any other object. So we could say uh, assign to the China object, we're going to assign the Gapminder data, and then we're going to filter the country is equal to China. And if we look at just the four first four rows of that, we'll see that the only country in here is China and it's its own object, but it is still this whole data frame with all the other columns and things. So this is like tremendously useful um, for dealing with uh, large data sets when you only want a particular thing. Um, like right now, I'm working with the Bridges Center on this one project that's only really pertaining to workers in Washington State. So I have like the whole ACS data and I only filter to Washington State, right? Okay, let's talk about graphing. Um, big shout outs to the ggplot unit. <laughs> I don't remember where I first saw this image, but it's really great. Um, <laughs> where's Lloyd Banks? Anyways, um, last week we talked about face R plots. And if we wanted to make, say, a plot of the life expectancy uh, in China over time from the Gapminder data set, 
this is what we would do. We'd say plot life expectancy by year. Our data is our China subset that we created earlier. And then we would do all of these labeling things. And these are information that help us make our points look right. Um, and this is our plot. Um, some of the rationale for why we would want a different graphics package than this one is uh, being able to manipulate it and change it to make it look nicer. It's often very difficult in the regular graphics package in R to make things look really nice. Um, and it's often difficult to make things quickly. So I want to motivate that with ggplot2, we can often do things uh, faster and in a way that's perhaps more legible to ours, us um, than like knowing what CEX means. <clears throat> An alternative way of plotting that many prefer, myself included, uh, use the ggplot2 package in R, which is part of the tidyverse, which also ggplot2 is get like, I think 11 years old now. It's like kind of been around the block. Like my, it's or, older than I was like, it came out while I was in high school. Let's just say that. Um, the core idea underlying the package is that layered grammar of graphics, we can break up elements of a plot into pieces and then we combine them with the addition symbol. Um, there are other graphics packages. There's an interesting blog here if you want to hear about somebody who really does not like ggplot. Um, so you may want to investigate those, but for the purposes of this class, um, at least for this homework, try ggplot2. So we can look at uh, life expectancy in China in ggplot. And this is um, very similar to that first graph we saw, but what it would look like in ggplot. Okay, so we have our data equals China, and then our x-axis is year, our y-axis is life expectancy, and we want a uh, scatter plot. Right. So let's talk about the structure of a ggplot and what it is that we just saw. So ggplot2 graphics objects consist of two primary components. The first of which are layers. These are the components of a graph. We add layers to a ggplot2 object using the add sign. Uh, this includes things like the lines that we want drawn, the shapes of dots, text that we want in our graphical space. The second thing are the aesthetics, which determine how the layers appear to the viewer. So we set aesthetics using arguments. So we could say things like color equals red inside of layer functions. Uh, this also includes being able to set the aesthetics for the location of things, the colors, the sizes, how the background looks, um, the size of the text, that kind of thing. Aesthetics also determine how data map to appearances. So we're going to talk about the differences between setting and mapping aesthetics here in a minute. Well, first, let's talk a little bit more in depth about what layers are. So the layers are the components of the graph, such as ggplot, which is the initial function that will create your graphical space. And it's also where you want to specify the data that's being input that you want presented in a graph. You can add layers like the geom point, which will create a scatter plot, or geom line, which creates line plots. And then if you want to add titles and things, you have ggtitle to add a title or a subtitle. xlab adds an xlabel, ylab adds a ylabel. You can use facet wrap and facet grid. Facet wrap is a layer that creates separate panels stratified by some factor for wrapping them around. We'll get into what words I just came out of my mouth <laughs> uh, in a sec. Uh, facet grid is a very similar idea, uh, but you can split by two variable groups along rows and columns. And then you can also set specific pre-made themes like theme black white, which replaces that default like ugly gray background that I showed you earlier. Uh, layers are all separated by a plus sign. Uh, for clarity, I usually put each layer on a new line unless it takes few or no arguments. So things like 
the X label and Y label, I tend to put on the same line. But when things are very different, like whether or not I want a scatter plot and what colors are going to be assigned where, I tend to put them on separate lines. So the aesthetics. These control the appearance of the layers that you created earlier. Things like um, what X and Y coordinate values to use in order to define where things show up on your graphical space. Color to set the color of elements based on some data value. Group will describe which points are conceptually grouped together for the plot. This is often used with lines. I know that I'm saying conceptual and you're maybe like, what you talking about? But uh, one thing to know is that computers have no idea what is going on in your data. So like continents aren't real to them. They only read it as like a set of numbers. So when you say like, these are continents and they're a meaningful group, that's when they know like, okay, Oceania is like pretty far away from Africa. Um, size sets the size of points and lines based on some data value. And alpha will set the transparency based on some data value. Okay, so earlier I said, sometimes we set things and map things. What was I talking about? So layers take arguments to control their appearance, such as point and line colors or transparency. Arguments like color, size, line type, shape, fill, and alpha uh, can be used directly on layers to set the aesthetic of them, okay? So in this case, we would say like, I have a scatter plot with G on point and I want all those dots to be red. So I would say color equals red, which like seems pretty straightforward. I just want to set all of these dots to red. The thing what happens when we set things is that they don't depend on the underlying data at all. Whereas we can add arguments to an AES, an aesthetics function, and now colors or any sort of uh, aesthetic will depend on your data. So now I could say, I want G on point and my aesthetic is colors equal to continent. And now all of my dots will be colored differently based on what continent they come from. So the information within the data set has provided information about how the graph is going to look. Um, question in the back. That's a good question. I would think that setting it would overwrite the ones that are in the aesthetic, but I'm not sure. Um, so the aesthetics function in the ggplot layer gives overall aesthetics to use in other layers, but can be changed on individual layers. So this includes switching X or Y to different values. Okay, so say you have a plot that has um, a bunch of dots on it. So it's just like a scatter plot, but you want to like draw a regression line through it. Okay, so one of the layers that wants to draw that regression line, you could like set to a specific color. And another one you could set as an aesthetic or map with using aesthetic to have all of the dots get colored in different ways. I know I'm saying a lot of words again, we're about to get into like all of the examples of this. <clears throat> this may seem pedantic, but precise language makes searching for help easier. So this is like the verbiage that you would want to look up. Like I want to map the line type in my lines. How do I get that to work is a way easier question for Stack Overflow uh, searches to understand. Now let's see all this jargon in action. Okay, so if we run ggplot and say that the data is equal to that China uh, data frame that we made earlier, and the aesthetics are x equals the year and y equals the life expectancy and nothing else, it will create a plot that is aware of our data already. So like on the y-axis, it's aware that life expectancy is gonna be like basically between the numbers 40 and 75. But it, we haven't given it any of the other layers, so it's not gonna draw anything yet. And then our x-axis, it's aware within the data of our years because it's mapping to the column that's in our data frame here. 
So it knows that between 1950 and 2000-ish is where all of our data is, okay? And then we can add, so we've used this plus sign to add our geom point. And geom point has inherited the aesthetics that are within the GG plot call. And so our dots are mapped on based on this information. We following so far? Cool. What is the aesthetic doing? So this aesthetic is saying that um, when we want to plot something on the x-axis, we're going to use information from the year column. When we want to plot something on the y-axis, we're going to use information from the life expectancy column. Um, and then aesthetic calls that are within your ggplot function will get inherited to all of the layers below. Okay. And now we can set all of our dots to be red by saying color equals red. And we can also make all the dots bigger by saying size equals three. <clears throat> and note that it doesn't depend on the data. Now we can add an X label that's year with a capital Y to give it a little bit more aesthetic appeal. A Y label that says life expectancy as two words and not as life EXP like the column in our data frame. We can add a GD, GG title that says life expectancy in China and add theme black and white. Looks a little bit nicer. And then we can provide an argument to theme black white that says base size equals 18 so that all the text is a little bit bigger and not as illegible as before. Okay. So let's take a little break here before I get into like really complicated plots um, for five minutes. Sound good? Cool. Um, do we have any questions before I get into yet more complicated plots? Yes, can. Um, I'm sorry, I, I think I might have missed the beginning of the question. So say when you're making a plot, and uh, is there a way to see, say you wanted to have a certain shade of orange dot, is there a way of seeing all of the colors that are available? Sure. So the there's a couple ways to do that. The first of which would be that like um, on the course website, there is... Forgetting where all the colors are. Yeah, here. Um, this shows all of the colors that are by name built into R. Um, but it also works with like hex codes. So if you wanted to just like say like. So then you could just have like any color and it would accept this six digit thing with a pound sign in front of it as the color instead of uh, red here.
uh, hand. Yeah, I may have missed this. Sorry. Can you explain um, what these do? I've seen like Team BW and Gypsum. Is, is that only the the kind of the background and the layout of the plot, or? Um. Yes, I think you've got it. Like correct already it is just like the background the layout a little bit of like the way the text looks uh the tick marks like here um that's kind of all it does no okay any other questions before we get back into it any questions from people on the internet Okay. It looks like so much fun outside. I'm so sorry, y'all. <laughs> I feel terrible. We're all on computers and everyone's just out having a good time with the wilderness. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk about plotting all of the countries. So we have this plot that we like for China. It's pretty good. What if we wanted to plot like all of the countries and like all of the data that we have. So let's say we just use that same plot and replace data equals China with data equals Gapminder. We would get this ugly plot. And one thing that I think is fun to do is keep your ugly plots that you made uh, <laughs> when stuff like this happens. Um, I have like a pretty good ongoing Slack thread with a friend of mine about things like this that happen. Um, but with all these dots, it's really hard to tell these countries apart. Maybe we should just like draw a line per country. Um, if you all you did was change geom point to geom line to get a line graph, uh, you would get this just wonderful piece of slack goofiness. Um, what we'll need to do is add to the aesthetic group equals country. And that way, the like conceptual idea that these numbers that are in our data are related to these other values in our data that we call country um, can be represented in the plot. Uh, since they're all red and set to be red, um, it still looks like a big jumble, but we're getting there. One thing we could do is just get rid of the size equals three setting. And now we get to see some semblance of what we wanted, right? We have plotted all of the countries across this x-axis of year. OK, um, do we have any questions so far? I know that I'm starting to lose people in terms of what all is going on. But um, one of the fun things that you get to do for your homework is tinker with all of these little nuances of what's happening. OK. But maybe we would want to highlight regional differences, because right now all we have is red and it's very difficult to tell. So one thing we could do is instead of uh, color equals red, we can map color to the continents. And we get to see some um, relationships just by setting the colors in the groups. Well, what if we separated the continents completely so that we could really tell all of the nuances within each continent? We could use that facet wrap. Recall earlier, I was like, you can wrap all this stuff together using other values in your data. And that was a lot of words. Um, you can add facet wrap and use this little tilde to say by con continent. And now we get little small multiples of each of our graphs and they're separated based on the inherited characteristics of, uh, from above are not separated by the inherited characteristics. They keep those characteristics and are separated by continents. Um, this is not, <laughs> I know there's somebody's really saying it out there. Or maybe it's just like a good speaker. I don't know. <laughs> um, it has like a default set of colors that it will just give out. Um, and in fact, once you see these default colors and you get a sense of them, you'll start to see in publications that people didn't care. <laughs> I see these like same six colors all the time. Um, that's okay. 
you don't have to like prove anything to anybody. There was this one, so like the top flight journal in my field in sociology is American Journal of Sociology. And somebody just used like the default like Excel graph in a paper. And I was like, yo, <laughs> that's a flex like I've never seen in my life. Anyways. <clears throat> We can adjust the text size. Um, one way we can do this is by getting rid of this base size 18 so that these years aren't being uh, overlapping. They'll get really small, but that's kind of okay, depending on how this graph is going to be used. One thing we could do to improve this graph even more is we could get that legend to not be all the way over to the edge one thing we can do to make that happen is to say legend.position equals these coordinates. And I kind of want to show you that this can happen, but also hazard against it. Um, and the reason that is, is like kind of selfish. It's that I can never really remember how these coordinates work. I have to look it up every single time. I've done it a thousand times. I always have to look it up. It never makes sense to me that the... This one needs to be positive to go to the left. I, I, I don't know. It, it just takes me forever to get these kinds of things to move using legend.position, but it can be done. But then it also begs the question, do we even need the legend? We can just delete it. We can say in our theme call, legend.position equals none. And we don't need it because the colors are separated into their own little boxes that are properly labeled. Um, okay. Do we have any other questions about this before we move on? I know that it's kind of a lot, but part of the homework is designed to help you like be able to look at all of this and manage it. Okay, cool. Yes, so the thing that we faceted by has now become the names of all of these things. So if these were like not properly labeled or like lowercase and you wanted them to be uppercase, you might wanna change that in your data ahead of putting it in the plot. Um, so if we want to store plots, uh, we can assign a ggplot object to a name. So we can say like life expectancy by year and assign it to all of that plot we just created or assign all of that plot we just created to life expectancy by year. Um, when you do this, the graph will not be displayed. It will just get stored in this object and move on. You can store the graph or you can show the graph by using a single line of code with just the object name in it. Or you can take that object and add more layers. I'm going to show you an example of both of these uh, things about storing plots this way. But first, I wanted to show you a thing about R that makes things a little bit more legible. Um, when you have things that are on either side of an operator, like this assignment operator, you can actually put them on a different line. And this is typically pretty useful. So you can say like life expectancy by year is going to get assigned this stuff that's been like indented for me because our studio will indent it for you. So you know, like the hierarchy of what's going on. And then also after commas, you can hit return and then put things on a separate line and they'll be indented to keep the hierarchy of the differences between commas. This is like a really useful way to make sure your code doesn't just all go on one line and get really long and complicated. And instead you can read it like a paragraph. So I can look at this and say like, okay, we have a ggplot with some data. The aesthetics are like this group of four things. It's gonna be a line graph. They added some labels here. There's a theme, they wrapped it by the continent. There's no legend. This is like preferable to if all of these addition signs were things next to each other on a line. Okay, so 
now that we've stored this whole graph into this life expectancy by year object, now all we have to do is run that object and it will create the graph. It'll put the graph where you want it to go or return the graph. <clears throat> you can also, from this object, just add more layers. So you can take that object and just add theme legend position equals bottom. It will forget that it was going to say legend position equals none and now give you the legend down here at the bottom. This is really useful um, when you want to just change something really quick, or if your graph is going to be going through a lot of different versions as you go through like a slide deck or something. One thing that you'll inevitably want to do is change the axes. We can modify the axes in a variety of ways, such as change the X and Y range using the X limb and Y limb functions that are layers that we can add. We can change to a logarithmic or a square root scale on either axis. And you can do this after like the data has been made. So like you don't have to go back and then make a column that is the log of your data and then set that in or map that into your data, uh, map that into your graph. You can at the point of graphing, log your data. You can also change where the major and minor breaks are in your graph using a scale X and then the type of data that's on your X axis um, layer. So here's something that you could do. You could say, I want to ggplot using the China data where the aesthetics are here and the GDP per capita. And I want a line graph of this information and then scale the Y axis. That is the GDP per capita. I want the breaks to be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and 5,000. And then you can say the labels I want from the scales package to use the dollar function, and it will make them look nice and have the dollar out front and a comma. And then you can say I want the x axis to be between 1940 and 2010. Even though we don't have any data, that's before 1950, I believe, or after 2012, or after 2005. Um, so we can set our graph to include these, this information, even though our data itself does not. <clears throat> Pretty neat. Um, one thing that you might want to try on your homework is looking through the scales package. It has a lot of great things for like not just dollar amounts, but other information as well. Um, perhaps the font is too small in that last graph. So one thing you could do is like, again, look into the base size things for your themes. Um, I tend to forget that this even exists and it takes me forever to change all that. <clears throat> Sometimes you might want to adjust the text and the ticks that are on the side of your graphs. They can be messed with more precisely using arguments to the theme layer. So you might remember I was using the theme layer here to like change the legend position. The theme layer is often where you want to change really specific things about your data, or not your data, uh, about your graph. So some examples, you can say um, the plot title. I want to give change the text of the plot title. So we'll use the element text function. I want the size to be um, rel two and h adjust zero. This will make the title twice as big as usual and left align it. You don't have to like remember all these little things I'm saying right now, but this is just to help get you started on like how to Google that I want to change this. Okay. You can change like the axis dot text, uh, the axis text on the x axis. Um, and change the angle of it so that it rotates the numbers and information just slightly. You can also change the color of your text on your axes. Um, there is, if you want to say like on this graph, only make 1980 blue, oftentimes this is like a mess. 
Um, if you want to do that, just let me know and I'll explain it to you, but that's kind of outside the scope of today's lecture. <laughs> um, you can also change the lengths of all the ticks in between each of the numbers. Um, one note is that theme is different than like theme gray or theme black and white or theme minimal, um, which you might also be using in a previous layer. So I recommend using theme after things like theme black and white and theme minimal. Um, otherwise, your theme black and white or theme minimal will overwrite things that you wrote in the other theme layer. So the order matters there. Even though for a lot of things in ggplot, the order does not matter. <clears throat> so if you want to change the colors and the shapes of things, scales are layers that control how the mapped aesthetics appear. So mapped again, mapped aesthetics are when the data, the information in the data determines the look of things in the graph. You can modify these using a, a formula where you'd say scale underscore the aesthetic you wanna change underscore the option that you'd like to change. And this is a layer where the aesthetic like color, shape, line type, alpha, scale, uh, size, fill, and the options, something like, I want to change it manually, I want to change it for a continuous outcome or discrete outcome, um, <clears throat> will uh, be how the function is set up. So some examples would be like scale, line type, manual, which would be, I want to personally write into this function that each of these lines is going to have a different look or scale alpha continuous will say, I want to vary the transparency of all of this data um, on a continuous scale. Or there's also scale color brewer and brewer, I'm sure you're like, what does that mean? Um, uses a palette from the colorbrewer2.org place. Um, they have a lot of really great sets of colors that you can use and you can like say, I want a diverging set of colors. I want a qualitative set of colors. Um, I want them to be color brown friendly, that kind of thing. And this is like a really quick way to just like take some colors and use them quickly. Um, question. Uh, with the alpha continuous, so would that just like assume the higher values of the data of, of a variable like becomes more transparent or less? I think that it's the other way. I think right. that it'll be more as the data gets higher, as the values on the continuous scale gets higher, they'll become more legible. And the smaller of it data will get more transparent. And the if you just put the variable name. Um, like there's like, uh, country or country. No. So the way that it would work is you would have to have alpha already be an aesthetic that was called up earlier up in the ggplot. Um, cool. And uh, when you're confused, just Google or Stack Overflow it. Again, ggplot2 is pushing like 12, like it's like a fifth grader. It's been around the block. Um, any problem that you'd run into is like been done. Um, often it's the case that people want to change their legend name and that can kind of be an undertaking. One way you can do this is to have like a scale color manual. This is our life expectancy plot from before, right? And we'd say, we'd give it to the name argument, uh, something in quotes, which continent are we looking at? And note that this uh, backslash n will add a line break. So it will say, which continent are we looking at? And it has this line break in it. And this is like an old <laughs> uh, timey way of writing line breaks. Um, and then we can also say, comma, um, our values are gonna be equal to C. Remember our concatenate function? This allows us to send it a vector um, where Africa, which is in our data, is gonna be equal to C green. Americas is going to be equal to turquoise one. Asia is equal to royal blue. Europe's equal to violet red one. Oceania is equal to yellow. And that's how we get manually specified colors for a color that was mapped earlier up in our object. Okay. 
So sometimes manual legends get really fussy. Um, and the reason for this is if you have additional scales uh, as layers, you have to specify again what the name of the legend is going to be. So I've included this example so that you have one to check on how this works. Okay. Even though this is like really hard to look at. And especially for like a brand new R user, this is just like, what in the world am I doing here? Um, let me explain. So there's a lot going on here. There are two different geom line calls. There's this one up here and there's this other one. And the second one draws a low S curve. So it does like a local regression smoother. It also facet wraps to make a plot for each level of continent. There are manual scales for size and color. And I use those manual scales for size and color to specify a legend name that I like. And there's custom labels, titles, and rotated X axis text. Okay. So let's go through it line by line. So we have our ggplot function that initializes our graph. We hand it the gapminder data to the data argument. And then our aesthetics are on the x-axis, we want the year. On the y-axis, we want life expectancy. And we want everything to get grouped by country. Cool. Then we draw a geom line. Note that the countries are grouped even though we haven't like colored them, okay? And then we add a geom line that is, we send to the argument stat equals smooth, method equals low S, and the aesthetic is group equals continent, okay? So we can suggest this geom line call, say that we want a smoother, that is, it's going to take the average of all of the things that are in the continent groups and draw a local regression line for each, okay? Then we'll facet wrap by the continent and specify how many rows we want. And so it'll give you that same shape that we had before, but since we're manually specifying it, if we had way more continents than this in the data, it would still just give us two rows. I'm showing you here the difference between the, or the something that you can do with facet wrap. So if you're like, that's just the same thing, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> and then I use scale color manual where the name is going to be life expectancy four. That's what we see down here. But now, curiously, for this geom line call, we said aesthetics colors equals country. Now there's nothing in our data that maps to the word country. So now the color is going to only be assigned based on when scale color manual finds something named country. I know this is confusing. This is how fussy it can get when you have a specific kind of thing you want to make like this. Um, and then our values for our scale color manual are going to be country equals black and continent equals blue. So we also added here color equals continent, which again is not in our data. But when scale color manual goes to check, it sees that color equals country and color equals continent, and we can assign those values colors down here, and then they'll show up in our legend in the bottom. Okay. Now, in order to include a scale for our size, we must also say size equals country and size equals continent, even though they don't exist, um, and then provide values for them in order for the lines that are presented here uh, to show up also in the legend. Um, we can add some uh, set, some alpha for each of these things so that we see that um, the average for the Americas is this blue line, um, but still see the information that's underneath that blue line. We can add theme minimal and change the size of the text, even though these X axes look kind of wild. Um, and then if we want to not have something on the X axis, we can just say um, quotes with nothing in them. Um, is one option that you have available to you to have like no x axis because it's pretty clear once you see 1950, 1960, 1970 that we're talking about year. <clears throat> we add a title and a subtitle. 
and then we change the theme axis text.x to change the text there to angle 45 so that it turns sideways and we can read it all. Um, so it might be better with angled labels. I tend to not want to see angled labels ever, but that's okay. Um, and the last thing is, again, I had to mess around with this and check it again to get it to do, <laughs> to go underneath over here. Um. <clears throat> So this is our plot at the end of that fussy example. And I'm hoping that that is probably not terribly useful today, but it will be in the future. Um, it is determining how many rows each of these graphs are going to be. So it's saying that we want these five plots to be graphed on two rows. Mm -hmm. Oh, we had another hand. Um, I actually know that the Africa and Americas mm -hmm. um, labels drop off. Um, that's just the magic of the facet wrap. Oh. It's just going to get rid of those. Because mm -hmm. um, it knows that all of those information are on the same scale. OK. So one observation is, uh, you could filter to identify these countries with dips in their life expectancy and investigate um, if you'd like. I think historians among us are pretty clear what's going on in here and here. <clears throat> Hand in the back. Um, let's see here. If you did a uh, scale, actually, I need to look at the data. Hold on. Uh, structure Gapminder. Um, OK, so the years are an integer, which makes me think that they're going to be considered a continuous scale. On So you would say like scale x continuous and then you could supply to that values and you could say like 1952 comma quotes with nothing in it comma 1962 or something like that and i think that would be how you'd want to get it done i'm sorry yes you can so that's what i meant to say <laughs> <laughs> no, that meant that's that's the right answer. You would want to set the breaks, not the values. Okay. So if you want to see a little bit more on customizing legends, you can move the legends around and flip their orientation and remove them all together, etc. Um, they're in the cookbook for our website. Um, which is a great resource for questions such as changing legend labels and little nuances about changing line types and sizes and colors and what have you. So we'll often get into the place where we want to save our GG plots. Uh, when you knit in our markdown file, any plots that you make are automatically saved into the figure folder in ping format. This is really nice. If you want to save another copy, perhaps of a different file type for use in a manuscript, you can use the GG save function. So like I mentioned before, um, when I make publications in Markdown, I um, actually don't just like put the code that makes the graph inside of my R Markdown. I tend to save my file as separate place and then load it in um, using the GG save. So in order to GG save, you can you use the ggsave function. Um, you would specify where you want the file to the file path and what you want to name it, um, as well as how you want it to be saved. It defaults to ping, but you can save it as a JPEG or um, a bitmap, what have you. Um, you say what plot you want saved. So this is an object that you created earlier. 
And you can specify things like the height and width and the units, uh, the DPI for nerds among us, that kind of thing. Um, if you didn't manually set font sizes, these will usually come out at a reasonable size. Like it will guess what you want based on the dimensions of the graph that you hand to it. Um, one bad and non-reproducible way that you can uh, export ggplots and you don't want to use the ggsave function is to click on export. So um, let's see here. If we go to, actually I need to make this. And then run this, didn't find ggplot. Okay, so what I'm saying is the bad and non-reproducible way to do this is you go, you make your cool little plot and you hit export here and you say save as image. And then you can like say, I want it like this big. And then just like name it right here, right? And save it and it will save at this size. And this will be the directory that it saves to. Also the image format that you like. Um, the reason I'm saying that this is bad and not reproducible is because like, if you want it to look exactly the same again, like you'd have to remember like the exact specifications for everything. It's kind of a mess. Um, you can also just like screenshot, which is also like a thing you can do um, is screenshot this or hit zoom here and then it buffs up really big and you can just snip it. But um, I do that sometimes. So I'm saying it's bad and not reproducible, but if your advisor is like, hey, yo, like, did you fix the title on that plot? You could just export it and just put it in an email. It's gonna be okay. Um, one book recommendation I have is the data visualization book by Karen Healy. Um, it's targeted at social scientists without technical backgrounds. So it's largely just talking about visualization principles that are good. Um, it uses R and the ggplot2 and the tidyverse. There's a free online version. It is pretty affordable in print. And if you just hang around people who are around CSS stuff, this is a book that you could just be like, hey, yo, let me get that. The, um, I'm trying to recall, I took Chris Adolph's like data viz class and I can't recall if this was one of the like texts, but I'm pretty sure it was. So it's a good one. Okay, let's talk about your homework. This one's a little bit more involved than the first one. You're going to pick some relationships to look at in the Gapminder data and write up a markdown, investigating that question graphically. You might work with a subset of the data. So like just Africa or just Europe or something. Um, to make it more manageable to deal with all the data. Upload the markdown and the HTML file to Canvas, just as you have with homework one. Include four to eight plots. All titles, axes, and legends should be labeled clearly, so no raw variable names, like none. Even if it's just country, like capitalize the C. You must have at least one graph with facet wrap or facet grid. One fun thing you get to do is figure out what's the difference between these two things. You must include at least one manually specified legend. And what I mean by this is like changing the names within it, changing what the values look like, that kind of thing. You can use other geoms like histograms, bar charts, add vertical or horizontal lines, etc. You might find this data visualization cheat sheet helpful. So let's go there and see what it's like. Um, so this cheat sheet tells you like most of the usual graphs you might run into uh, using ggplot2. Um, it has a pretty good description of like how to look all of these things up um, and what each of these things means. Um, so have fun with that. I still look this up all the time um, when it's stuff that's not just like geom smooth, geom line, 
uh, I don't know, geom area. <clears throat> Keep doing that. Okay. And then your document should be pleasant for a peer to look at with some organization. So some of these principles that we learned in the first week, like how to make a subheader, that kind of thing, including some uh, ordered list or something. You must write up your observations in words as well as showing the graphs. So I don't expect like a big write up, but like, don't just turn in four graphs, like describe what you see is going on and like maybe create some sort of narrative about what you are interested in looking at. Um, use chunk options, echo equals false to limit the code and output you show in the HTML. Okay, so we don't wanna see the code. We wanna see the cool graphs and stuff that you say that's also cool about them. Okay, and that's it for today. Do we have any questions? Okay, great. Well, y'all have a good one. Take care.